we have a special treat uh, with our uh, um, very own Max Lampasona coming up. To recite something for us. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'd like to share with you what it means to me to be a part of a team. On January 15, 1892, in Springfield, Massachusetts, the official rules for basketball were published for the first time. Until then, people played the game of basketball with a real basket perched on top of a pole or hanging from a wall. Everybody tried on their own to get the ball into the basket. Now suddenly it became a team sport. No matter how great you are at b-ball, you won't be able to win unless you are a part of a team. On the team, different people do different things. They are all working together for the same goal. Dennis Rodman was a player for the Chicago Bulls who didn't shoot very often. And when he did, he didn't often score. According to the people who are basketball fans of this team, he was a pretty impressive rebounder for his team. Even though Michael Jordan, who was a great shooter, people said, the Chicago Bulls would have lost lots of games if all they had were great shooters. A team needs people to rebound and play defense as well. My dad tells me there's no I in team, and team in our household stands for together everyone achieves more. He also taught me short-term pain for long-term gain. This encourages me when I don't feel like doing my chores or being the best max that day. But my mom reminds me of what, of what role each of us play in our family, and she never lets me forget that my dad never complains about going out into the cold to provide for us. Going on six or nine month deployments to war zones, working late after my bedtime, and getting up earlier than I wake up, and playing his part for our team. After that, I usually agree with her and try my best to shake it off. It doesn't always happen right away, but my mom says it's a process, so be patient with myself and do my best. To play on Jesus' team, you don't need to have a really important job in a church or be a major baptism scorer. And he doesn't play favorites. As long as you're a team player and you do what our head coach wants in faith and love, you'll find that you too can be one of his MVPs. Jeremiah 29.11 tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I am blessed to be on Jesus' team and on the Lampasona team. Thank you. Amen. So that's our first sermon of Sabbath. Amen? And here's the scripture to be read by Chris Mata. Please stand while we read our scripture reading found in Exodus chapter 31 verses 16 through 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a per perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day the, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Amen. You may be seated. One preacher said uh, uh, some time ago that no one has the monopoly of preaching. Amen? Amen? The Lord speaks to everyone, and we're excited that we're able to showcase uh, brothers and sisters here in our church and that we have a platform where the Lord can speak through them. And this is an opportunity when our brother Gabriel speaks uh, uh, to us and allowing God to, uh, to speak through him. Amen? Amen? Gabriel? OK, 
Can you hear me now? <laughs> it's been a while since I've done any kind of preaching, so uh, pardon any nervousness you see. Um, if you hear any knocking, that's just my knees, don't worry. Um, the Sabbath is, is uh, something kind of distinguishing about Seventh-day Adventists, is it not? There aren't a whole lot of other Christians who keep the true Sabbath. There are a few other denominations, but by and large, the vast majority of those who profess faith in Jesus don't keep it. Um, and with that, let's say, uh, let's say one more prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, God of all creation, um, God of each of us individually, I feel so uh, utterly unworthy to be up here, but you've called me for a reason. And, uh, I, pray that, uh, I pray that our church family here, including myself, will receive a message from you that the words that come through my mouth are not mine but yours and that uh, everybody not just me but everybody is filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, convict us where it is necessary and bring us ever closer to you whatever whatever it takes um, nothing is worth losing heaven over in the name of your son Jesus amen Let's see if this works I'm trying to get this to work. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> In our scripture reading, um, we see a couple of very important things. Um, let's read it again. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay, maybe, uh, Nathan, if you could just do the slides for me, I'll let you know. The Sabbath uh, has its foundation in the law of God, which is the law of love. If we're keeping the Sabbath in order to be saved, that's legalism, is it not? And um, that kind of Sabbath keeping, legalistic Sabbath keeping, will only result in us being lost unless we repent. Obedience saves no one, which is a truth that you find all throughout the Bible, but at the same time, saved people obey. As Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Those who truly love God will follow all of his commandments, including the fourth, in keeping the Sabbath holy. Um, and as a Seventh-day Adventist, it's, it's, it's not a question of when is the Sabbath, because we already know that. It's, it's, not a question, it's, a, it's a question of, do we truly love God enough to keep the Sabbath? And honestly... If we don't love God enough to keep the Sabbath, we don't love him at all. If we don't love God enough to keep any of the commandments, we don't love him at all. We need to remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is that commandment keeping goes so much deeper than just on the surface level. Um, sin starts in the mind, and uh, that's where That's where we need to uh, keep a guard over. Um, like I said, it's not enough to know when the Sabbath is. It's, it's not enough to go to church on the Sabbath. It's not enough to go to nursing homes on Sabbath afternoons and sing to the elderly. It's, it's not enough to do any of these things. The only kind of Sabbath keeping that God will accept is when we keep the Sabbath holy because we love him. And how do we love him? Follow his commandments. We read the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
The Sabbath is a part of God's law, and the devil's ultimate goal is to get us to break it in any part, really. Uh, next slide, Nathan. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. If the devil can get us to break the uh, Sabbath commandment, that's really the easiest way to get us caught up in idolatry. Uh, hold that thought, because we'll come back to it later. During the Paris Olympics in 1924, there was a Scotsman by the name of Eric Liddell. Lid Liddell, little, I'm not sure how to say his name. He was a celebrated sprinter, and he was expected to win gold in the 100-meter race. However, he discovered that the time trials for his event were going to fall on a Sunday, which he believed to be the Sabbath. And even though he had the day wrong, he had the right attitude. And even though he had relentlessly trained and his country had invested in, in, in him, he refused to run on the day that he believed to be the Sabbath. And this decision put him under immense pressure from not only his family and not only his teammates, but from his own government. That's something we're going to experience in the future, is it not? God will understand, they said. Your country is counting on you. Do it just once. God will understand. But he said, no, I can't do it, not even once. Well, it turned out that Liddell could run in another event that did not conflict with his beliefs, and that was the 400-meter race. During the time trials, he did not perform well, and his teammates wondered if he could even secure a medal. But Liddell believed the results were in the hands of God. And just prior to running the final, he was handed a slip of paper from an American with a profound message on it. Those who honor me, I will honor. When the gun sounded, Liddell ran like he was possessed and broke the standing record to finish first. Eric Liddell firmly believed in obeying God no matter the cost, and that meant following every one of his Ten Commandments, including the fourth. But how many of us actually truly keep the Sabbath holy? And that's something I'm learning to do recently. I'm, I'm honestly just getting to a point where I'm really starting to enjoy a good relationship with God, where I'm really learning to love him and enjoy the Sabbath. And I praise God for Kirk coming here being our Bible worker, because if not for him, or should I say, if not for God using Kirk, I may not, I probably wouldn't be up here, you know? And how does the Sabbath relate to the covenant? Uh, as I said in the scripture reading, the Sabbath is referred to, to be kept through all the generations of Israel, and that includes us as spiritual Israel. So the Sabbath is, is the Sabbath a covenant on its own? or is a part of a larger covenant? I would like to suggest both. Next slide. What is God's covenant? Now, the definition of a covenant is usually a formal, solemn, and binding agreement. A written agreement or promise usually under seal between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. Uh, next slide. Behold, the days come, Jeremiah 31, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And in Hebrews, we read in, uh, this, this passage again, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So how important is it that God put this twice in the Bible? But what was this covenant all about? What was God's part? And what was Israel's part? And as an extension, what is our part? Uh, next slide. This covenant has for its foundation Jesus and his sacrifice for us. Had it not been for the sacrifice of Jesus, God would not be able to write his laws on our hearts. Had it not been for the sacrifice of Jesus, we would have destroyed ourselves a long time ago. 
The word in covenant in Exodus 31.17 is in Hebrew the same word that is used in Jeremiah. This word means alliance, pledge, constitution, ordinance, alliance of friendship between God and man. Covenant, a divine ordinance with signs or pledges. I like the one where it says alliance of friendship. Abraham was a friend of God after all, wasn't he? Next slide, please. What was God's part? And in Genesis 3.15, we find the first promise of redemption. Uh, so, if we can turn to Genesis 3.15. I won't make it work too much. I got most of the verses in the PowerPoint. But say, uh, when you get there, say amen. And I will put enmity, enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So here we find the first promise of redemption, and in Genesis 22.8, we read, where, uh, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. This verse is, is, is kind of a double meaning here. They didn't have the sacrifice in this story, as most of us know the story. God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, so they didn't take any lambs. And Abraham said, God will provide himself. Now, God did provide a sacrifice that day, didn't he? But if we read, the way we read this verse, and God and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And in Genesis 4.1, Eve gives birth to Cain, and she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The actual wording in the Hebrew more literally says it this way, I have gotten a man, the Lord. And an article from creation.com says, Eve apparently believed God's promise. When she had her firstborn son, she explained Cain's name with the statement, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. A more literal translation would be, as we just said, I have gotten a man, the Lord. And according to another source, the force of the words and the construction are so very strong that the Jerusalem Targum renders them, I have gotten a man, the angel of the Lord. And we see this confirmed in Desire of Ages, where it's on page 31, the Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. So, what, so God's part of the covenant is to provide the way for us to be redeemed and to receive salvation, if we choose. God did all the work, didn't he? It's very simple for us to be, to be saved. I mean, I don't know why we have to make it so difficult sometimes. I don't know why I have to make it so difficult. But what's our part? In Acts 2.38, Peter says to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 16.31, Paul says to the jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, the Sabbath is referred to also by God as a sign. If you go to the next slide, one more. Um, what, is it a, what is it a sign of? Um, go to the next one. Another one. Okay. In Ezekiel 20, verse 12, More also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And hallow my Sabbath, verse 20, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The word sign used in Exodus 31, 17 is the same word that is used twice in Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 and 20. It means sign, signal, a distinguishing mark, banner, remembrance, miraculous sign, and token, ensign, standard, miracle proof. And the Sabbath is indeed a distinguishing mark. It's always been what has distinguished the true worshipers of God from pagans and even people who know the truth but reject it. There will be many sincere Christians in heaven who did keep Sunday and who didn't know any better. The danger comes, though, when we hear God's truth on the Sabbath or anything else and reject it. You'll go to the next slide. In keeping the Sabbath holy, we are truly acknowledging or remembering several things. Number one, we remember that God is creator 
and sovereign over the universe. Exodus 20, verse 11 says this, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And if the devil can get us to break the Sabbath, then he's gotten us to deny at least three things, those being God's sovereignty, his creatorship, and his authority. Also in Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6, God says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. In another place, God says, I will not share my glory with another. Number two, God is sovereign over us individually, and I love this verse. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Number three, the third thing we remember is Jesus is both our creator and our redeemer, our personal savior. In Isaiah 45, 12, uh, God says, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my, even I, even my hands have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. John 3.16, the I believe John 3.16 to be the foundational truth of the Bible, one of them. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the, insert your name here. That he gave his only begotten son. Stop believing that God loves the world and not you. For God so loved Arnie. Right? For God so loved Larry. For God so loved John. Everyone, everyone in this room, everyone on this planet, God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Uh, The fourth thing that we remember, God is the one who sanctifies us. We cannot sanctify ourselves. As Jeremiah said in chapter 13, verse 23, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit by yourself? Does it work? You might be able to go for a little bit, but eventually you'll be like that dog that returns to his vomit. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Listen to how many times God says, I. Pay attention to this verse. God is doing all the work. Listen to how many times God says, I. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. (laughs) God's doing all the work. All we've got to do is believe, repent, and be baptized. God is also the one who fulfills Ezekiel 37, 5, and 6 in us. And that says, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Dry bones were a symbol of death. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. All we've got to do is come to him, like the prodigal son. The same law, if we'll go on to the, to the next slide. Um, no matter how dried up and worthless we may feel, or how dread, dead in trespasses and sins, God can restore us to life through his word and spirit. If we take some time to get to know each other in this church, how many uh, amazing testimonies will we find? How many people have been rescued from drugs? How many people have been rescued from abuse? Or um, how many people have been rescued from sexual addictions? Anything. Uh, Go to the next slide, please. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 372, the same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. And you see, once we accept Christ, when God the Father looks at us, he sees Christ's perfection. He doesn't acknowledge us as sinners anymore. We, st- we have things to overcome. 
but he sees us as clothed in the righteousness of Christ simply because we've accepted Christ. That's all it takes. Number five, we acknowledge that we are the children of God. In John 1, verses 12 and 13, uh, the apostle says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, it's God's will for you to be his children. And in Revelation 21, 7, this is an amazing verse. I love it. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Number six, we acknowledge that God's ways are best, and it is he who guides us. Our ways lead only to death. In Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Psalm 48, 14. For this God is our God forever. He will be our guide even unto death. Which, by the way, has a little aside a plug that you can download if you have a smartphone. It's called Scripture Singer, and that's a scripture song in that. Uh, Kirk will tell you sometimes when we see Bible verses that are in that app, the song would start playing in our head. So it's a great way to memorize Scripture. Proverbs 16.25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And in number seven, we acknowledge the truth that it's the foundation of the entire Bible, that God is love. Again, the apostle writes in 1 John 4.8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Uh, next slide, please. And remember that in Truly keeping the Sabbath, we are acknowledging God as a creator and sovereign over the entire universe. In the Sabbath commandment, we find three very important details, and they are the details that make up any kingly or royal seal. And you probably heard this before. They are, number one, the name of the ruling official, the title of the ruling official is number two, and number three, the territory. For example, here in the United States, it would be Barack Obama, President of the United States. Now let's read the fourth commandment, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, and see if you can spot these components. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Next slide. For in six days the Lord, that's his name, made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is. He created, made as his creator, his territory, heaven and earth, the universe, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. And this is the seal that will be what the people of God will be sealed with here in the near future. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can see the signs. We can see how the world's getting, how our country's getting. It's going to be soon. So don't sleep. Wake up. And get right with God. Now remember how we said that the Sabbath breaking is the easiest way to get us caught up into idolatry? Roger Morneau. How many of you have heard of Roger Morneau? He was an absolute giant in the faith. A man that God used to pray in mighty ways. And he was the author of several books on prayer. And a couple of others including his testimony book called A Trip into the Supernatural. And his story is a true example of what God can do with a life. It's an example of how God can pluck a person directly from the ranks of Satan and make him one of his own. He was raised a Catholic. Then his mom died and he declared himself an atheist. Then he got involved with spiritualism. Then directly involved with outright Satanism. And then finally, praise the Lord, God brought him into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As I said, he was an absolute giant in the faith. In, in one of the meetings that uh, Roger Morneau was attending, well, before he became an Adventist, while he was involved with Satanism, he wrote uh, these few paragraphs. The priest, the Satanist priest, mentioned the fact that Satan has chosen Sunday as his day. The Creator has chosen the seventh day of the week. Lucifer has chosen to call his day the first day of the week, Sunday. And regardless of what people claim 
to worship. Um, they worship God, the Creator, by observing that particular day, Sunday. They are bringing homage and respect to Satan. Harsh words, but words that need to be heard. At the time, uh, he's writing this in first person, at the time I had never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist in my life. The priest didn't talk about Seventh-day Adventist. He talked strictly about Adventists. The priest was telling us that necromancy, as I mentioned earlier, is the belief that the dead have entered into a higher state of existence, etc. He says, for centuries, friendly demon spirits have worked diligently to establish and hold up in the religious convictions of all people the belief that man has an immortal soul. Then he boasted about the fact that he called him the master, was so smart in that he had deceived the whole world, even in this age of great scientific knowledge and understanding. Then one person put up his hand, and the priest says, Yes, what do you want? Do you want to say something? And the man said, What about the Adventists? You can't count them deceived regarding the state of the dead. And I got a question. How come they can't be brought under the great deception? The priest responded and said, You're right. I apologize. Here I made a mistake. When I said all the millions of people living on the face of this planet, everybody was honoring the great master, I forgot the Adventists. They are so few in number when you think of all the billions. I didn't think to mention them, so I'm sorry. Then he says, Secondly, the reason why they can't be brought into the great deception? Let me explain it. The priest continued, Now, my next statement is going to upset some of you. But what I'm going to tell you is the honest truth. It is factual. It is reality. The fact that Adventists, and listen to this very closely, the fact that Adventists observe the biblical Sabbath of creation and reverence the Creator that day, it makes it impossible for the spirits to deceive them. <laughs> Think about that. If you truly keep the Sabbath, you cannot be deceived. It's impossible. He went on to say, they are given very special help and great spiritual insight. Under these conditions, they are not ordinary people. So is it worth it to keep the Sabbath truly? You tell me. But this protection only applies to those who truly keep the Sabbath. Those who have heard the Sabbath truth and rejected even Seventh-day Adventists, and I've known a few, cannot count on being protected from idolatry. What is idolatry? It's, idolatry is not just the worship of a statue. Here in the United States, we kind of uh, we think it's silly to go and worship a statue, don't we? But idolatry is beyond that. It's, it's at least two things. It's an obsession such that God is not first in our lives. It's also trying to make something holy that God did not make holy. For example, Sunday observance. And there is actually a Seventh-day Adventist church in our country that is starting Sunday services, and they're doing it under the pretense of evangelism. And remember how that failed in the early church and how the Catholic Church was born? The Sabbath is a miraculous sign as well. God is the one who enables us to truly keep the Sabbath. As we said in Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20, and Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, true Sabbath keeping is a sign that God is sanctifying us. You will know them by their fruits. As we already said, obedience doesn't save us, but saved people obey. The Sabbath is the only commandment that's also a time. And this is something that you learn about in Revelation, Daniel and Revelation seminars. True Sabbath keeping is definite proof that Jesus is our Redeemer, our personal Savior, and that we truly love him and are true Christians. We come on dangerous ground when we hear the Sabbath truth, like we said earlier, or any other truth of the Bible, and reject it. In Galatians 3.29 says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and here is according to the promise. One of the objections you hear all the time in Christian, in, in the vast majority of Christianity, is, oh, Sabbath was just for the Jews. That was just given at Sinai. But if you read the Bible, you're going to see that's not true. When God created Adam and Eve, they saw God keep the Sabbath, and like any good children, they want to be like their dads. In Exodus 16, 27 to 29, God is speaking of the Sabbath, and he was, the Israel was having problems keeping the Sabbath holy. So God says, How long refuse you to keep my Sabbaths and laws, my commandments and laws, rather? By this verse alone, it's clear that God's law was in existence before Mount Sinai. 
And as we already read the verse in Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul spoke of this objection as well. If you be Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, then you're part of Abraham's seed, as we already said earlier. Today, because we profess faith in Jesus, we're claiming to be spiritual Jews. You are part of spiritual Israel. And regardless of being a Christian or not, God's law is binding on everyone. A German in the USA is bound by our laws here in the United States, as long as he's here. And whether a person calls themselves a Christian or not, we're all on God's earth. He's the one who created it. Therefore, just by natural, by the fact that we're alive on God's earth, in his universe, we're bound by his laws. The key is to remember that we can't keep his laws in our own strength. We need to ask God to transform us and to let him transform us. Then he gives us grace and strength to keep, us his, to keep his law. As you see in, in, in the Exodus, God first saves us, and then he asks us to keep his law. God didn't give his commandments while they were still in Egypt. Or he didn't speak them on the mountaintop while they were still in Egypt. But going back again to Galatians 3.29, Paul refers to a promise here. Errors according to the promise. What is this promise? And I would like to propose there are at least uh, seven different promises, seven different things that I, came, that I could think of. And if you'll go start going through the next slides. Promise number one is to bless and be blessed. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God commands Abraham to leave his country of residence and to go to a land that he would show him. God promised Abraham in this verse that he would make a great nation from Abraham. He would bless Abraham. He would make Abraham's name or his reputation great. And that Abraham would be a blessing. God also promised that he would bless those who blessed Abraham and curse those who cursed him. And that in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And there are several things promised here. And indeed, God carried out his promise to Abraham. And promise number two is that we will be glorified in the future. In Romans 8, 14 through 17... Paul talks about how those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And if you look at verse 17, it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Suffering comes first, and then we're glorified with Christ. Yeah, trials are God's appointed method to refine us and to bring us closer to God. And we're promised that if we're led by the Spirit of God, then we're children of God. This is a choice that we, each of us have to make individually. Um, Elisha's choice to serve God can't save me. My choice to serve God can't save Elisha. It's an individual choice. But it can influence us. It can influence others to follow Jesus. Uh, when you get to heaven, how many people are going to come up to you and say, because you told that children's story on Sabbath, I gave my heart to Jesus that day. Or because you gave money to this missions project, where I grew up in, in wherever, whatever part of the world, I gave my heart to Jesus. I heard the gospel, and I decided to follow him. You ever heard the song by Ray Boltz, Thank You? That's what we're talking about here. This verse promises us that we'll be glorified. Now, this is a future event, because we need first to be sanctified, and then at the second coming of Jesus, we'll be saved from sin, finally and forever, and we'll be glorified with him. Promise number three, going on this same premise, is that we'll be children of God. In Galatians 4, 4 through 7, we'll just read the verse here. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. God sent Jesus to redeem us, that we might receive the adoption of sons. When Adam and Eve fell, the devil claimed dominion over this world. And he still tries to claim dominion over us. Even though the devil knows he's going to die now, he's going to take as many people with him and he's gonna, as he can, and he claims dominion over each and every person, simply because we're sinners. But God sent Jesus, praise the Lord, to break every last chain that the devil tries to hold us with. And I don't know what your chains are, but whatever they are, God can break those chains off of you. God sent Jesus to break all these chains. And for anyone who wants to, God holds out the invitation to them to become a son or daughter of God. 
There is no person so sinful that they cannot find mercy and forgiveness at the foot of the cross. You know, to tell you a little bit of my story, <laughs> this is not in the sermon, but I felt like God is pleading me to say this. Um, I've struggled with various addictions in the past, among them being um, caffeine. Caffeine is addictive. Um, and I drank a lot of it, and when I, I quit cold turkey, I ended up in the emergency room. And I, I was addicted to video games. And probably the most insidious is I was addicted to pornography. There are none so sinful that you can't find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. All you need to do is come. Steps to Christ. We go to the next slide. Here is where thousands fail. They do not believe that Jesus pardons them personally, individually. They do not take God at his word. It is the privilege of all who comply with the conditions to know for themselves that pardon is freely extended for every sin. Put away the suspicion that God's promises are not meant for you. They are for every repentant transgressor. Strength and grace have been provided through Christ to be brought by ministering angels to every believing soul. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength, purity, and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. He is waiting to strip them of their garments, stained and polluted with sin, and to put upon them the white robes of righteousness. He bids them live and not die. Galatians 4, verse 6, as we already read, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If I remember right, I once heard that calling God Abba is, is the same as my daughter calling me Daddy. Think of the intimacy of that title. God wants us to call him Father or Daddy. He wants us to think of him as a little child regards their father, like Kirk's kids think of him, and like my daughter thinks of me. Promise number four. Eternal life. Titus 3 verse 7 says, That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Those who believe in Jesus, who allow him to forgive them and transform them, will receive eternal life. Promise number five. Heaven. What better promise, right? Other, other than Jesus, of course. Hebrews 11, verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. And, you know, many things in the Bible are based on the principle of type and antitype. There was the lamb, the type, and there was Jesus, the antitype. God promised to give Abraham the promised land. God also promises us the heavenly promised land. And if we are faithful, we will inherit this promised land. Promise number six, an everlasting name in addition to heaven. And this passage is kind of long, so just bear with me. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come. Is it not? And my righteousness is to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Next slide. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name that is better than of sons and daughters. God just doesn't want us to be sons and daughters. He wants us to be better than that. And that's what he has in mind for us. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord. That's us, because we're not biological Jews, but we are spiritual Jews. That join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Promise number seven. You will delight yourself in the Lord. 
Isaiah 58, 13, and 14, probably one of the more famous Old Testament passages on the Sabbath. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Next slide. God honors those who honor him. From uh, 1 Samuel 2.30, just as the, uh, Eric Liddell in our opening illustration discovered. Just listen to these stories from the Adventist Review magazine. I picked three stories. There were a couple of articles about, that were published by the Adventist Review of, of people in our day that uh, God rewarded for keeping the Sabbath. And he honored them in, for keeping the Sabbath. Number one, uh, I'm going to butcher a couple of these names, but that's all right. Uh, Nana from Ghana. She says, I had Sabbath classes nearly every semester at the university. I once took an exam on Sabbath and got my worst grade, a D, when I usually get A's. Then I skipped a class every Sabbath and still got an A by borrowing a friend's notes and studying on my own. I used to feel torn over whether to take exams on the Sabbath. Now that I have graduated, I say to the glory of God that I have always been able to refuse to work during the Sabbath hours. Um, Mary Steffens, number two. She says, I would not work on Sabbath when I was in basic training in the Army. So they moved to kick me out. I was sent to the casual bay where those who are deemed unfit await discharge orders. I kept my standards high. After four weeks in casual bay, my captain called a meeting with me and said, you are one of our better trainees. What's the problem? I explained about my Sabbath. Not only did she reinstate me in the fourth week of training, but the following Sabbath she had an officer's car take me to church. Happy me. Patience from Zimbabwe. This is my favorite one. While attending the University of Zimbabwe, my friend and classmate had an IT exam scheduled for Sabbath. Without taking the exam, she would not graduate. She asked for a change of date, and the dean refused. We prayed in a prayer band for almost two weeks, but the lecturer's hearts were not changed. Exam day came, and my friend passed several classmates going to the university for the exam as she headed to church. The prayer band didn't give up, and our morning prayers floated the Almighty. And this is the best part. When lunchtime came, my friend saw several classmates waiting outside the church. They told her that the electricity had gone off at the exact moment the exam was supposed to start. The lecturers were forced to delay the exam to another day. So you tell me, is it worth it to keep the Sabbath? As you can see, true Sabbath keeping has many blessings and miracles wrapped up in it. It's indicative of your relationship with God. It is evidence that God is working on you. And those who remain faithful will have the eternal blessing of eternal life with the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. They will have the eternal blessing of keeping the Sabbath in the earth made new. And as a final statement, our, our closing hymn is Standing on the Promises. And I hope you can see how that hymn is applicable to this sermon. So many promises wrapped up in Sabbath keeping. And I want to challenge you as you go out and leave church today, find ways to keep the Sabbath in honor and keep it holy. And when you come into a difficult situation, maybe your boss is going to threaten you if you don't keep the Sabbath. Or who knows what else. But keep the Sabbath and watch the Lord work.
Lord, Father God, the God who wants to adopt us as sons and daughters, the God who wants us to have such intimacy with him that we will call him Abba, or come more commonly known as Daddy. Lord, for some of us, that's not an easy thing to do. Some of us haven't had very good fathers. And please help us to remember that you are nothing like our earthly fathers. Even if we had great earthly fathers, you are so much better than that. Amen. As, as my nephew once said, thank you for Sabbath. Thank you so much for Sabbath. Help us to fall in love with you so deeply that we will do nothing to break the Sabbath, that we will do nothing to ever leave you again. Help us to settle into the truth such that we will not be moved, that we will receive your seal in these final days. May we be excited about your truth. May we be excited about the return of Jesus. And may we be caught up in the clouds when he is here. We ask your blessing upon the rest of our Sabbath. This church is only a part of it. Bless us as we leave here. And uh, help us to be your sons and daughters. Convict us of your truth, of your love, how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.